I don't have a voice operated chatbot, so I have my clicker. Mm -hmm. We shall see how this goes. Um, let's talk about serverless PHP. But before we talk about that in general, I'm going to talk about serverless first. So let's talk about how we actually deploy stuff to the web. And I'm really old now. So when I started in this stuff, we only had physical servers. There was no other way to do these things. You bought them from Dell or HP or whatever. And if you were lucky, you had something called a data center you could put them in. But most of my clients put them under their desks. That was where we started. And that's an extremely inefficient way of serving a website, particularly in terms of power and things like that. So we got better at this stuff. And the first thing we got better at was virtual machines. The obvious canonical example today is EC2. Where what we have now is we have big servers and we put lots of virtual computers on top of our big servers and this is way more efficient. Doing a little bit better though, because there's still quite a lot of overhead in virtual machines. So we invented containers and Kubernetes is a container orchestra orchestration system which enables us to manage many containers on one piece of hardware in, again, more efficient use of resources. Who here is using containers for deployment? Anyone? A few people? Virtual machines, EC2 stuff? Yeah, pretty much everyone. Just literally a bare metal server? One or two, few people. What about platform level? What about if we take away dealing with the containers and let someone else deal with it? Uh, Cloud Foundry is the open source system. The big commercial player is Heroku. Something like that, you no longer have to worry about the container side, they deal with that for you. And we can take that one further level to serverless. OpenWhisk is the open source system. The com big commercial one is called Lambda, which you have probably heard of. Multiple different ways to serve a website or a web app or an API or whatever. As you go up the chain, you are going to increase your abstraction layer. You are having to think a lot less about the nuts and bolts as you go up. This is technology, this is software engineering. For everything that is good, there is a opposite. In this case, it's control. You get more control as you get closer to the bare metal. That's what happens. Where you sit on here depends on what level of control against what level of abstraction you actually want. So let's talk about serverless, because that's what we're here for. Quote from Nate Taggart, who's the CEO of Stackery. Serverless is all about composing software systems from a collection of cloud services. With serverless, you can lean on off-the-shelf services, re services resources for your application architecture, focus on business logic and application needs. So when we talk about serverless, we're talking about more than just the bit of code you run in Lambda. The whole point of serverless is you are connecting third-party resources, other people's stuff. So it's slightly different way of thinking. The bit we actually think about initially about serverless, and the bit I'll be talking about most, is a subset of serverless called functions as a service. It's not all of serverless. Function as a service is just the code bit. It's your code, you deploy it to the cloud, it runs only when it is needed. If it's not needed, it's not running, it's not, it's not even in memory. It scales automatically. I particularly like that one because I am not remotely interested in the ops side of things. Server admin, no interest whatsoever. Automatic scaling, wonderful. And you only pay for execution. I also like that one because I'm skinned. If I don't have to pay for it, that's always good for me. So if no one is actually using my API, I'm not paying any money. I quite like that as an idea. I think that's a really cool idea, actually. So where are the servers? It's serverless. This is obviously a complete and utter misnomer because there are obviously servers. They are not your problem. You never, ever have to think about them. But they still exist. There are two use cases. Synchronous use case. This is send a request, get a response. Web API, chatbot, things like that. They are synchronous, you are waiting for a response. You could probably guess the other one, it's asynchronous. For asynchronous, we don't wait for the response. Usually these are events that happen behind the scenes. 
So the obvious ones are things like webhooks. You push something to a repository, a webhook gets triggered. When it finishes, doesn't matter. Um, drop something into an S3 bucket, and then some sort of functionality runs to do something. It's asynchronous. There are also a lot of benefits to this. No need to maintain infrastructure. It's not your problem. You can concentrate on your application code. You're not worrying about things that do not make you money. You pay only when you use it. It's language agnostic. Whoever wins that book for leaving the fantastic joined in feedback you are going to leave me soon will get a book all about JavaScript on Lambda. But actually, Lambda and all the other providers are language agnostic. You do not have to use JavaScript if you don't want to. I am not a good JavaScript programmer. I'm rubbish at it. And there's enough to be getting on with, with learning this whole paradigm, that doing it in a language you're comfortable with is probably worth it, because you're learning enough as it is. So that's the good sides. We had the up and the down on the first slide. Now we've got the benefit and what I'm calling challenges as opposed to downsides, because I try to be positive here. There's a startup latency. I told you your code is not in memory if it's not being used, because you only pay for execution. Therefore, there is latency to get your code running. If you are writing a real-time stock trading system, this is not the tool for you. There's a time limit. You cannot run your code for two hours in a single threaded process. It will not work. If you need to run something for a long time, you need to split it up into lots of little bits and preferably scale it horizontally because it scales really well. State is external. This is a problem for everyone other than PHP programmers because every other web language appears to store global variables in state between requests. But we never ever do that. Have you noticed that? PHP developers, PHP does not store global variables between requests. This is why PHP is such a good web language. We can scale horizontally because we've already put our state somewhere else. Everyone else doesn't appear to do that way and they get really confused when they hit serverless and a state has to be external. And they go, oh. And we go, well, of course you're not going to store your session as a global variable. because We've never done that. More importantly, it is a different way of thinking. You are connecting third-party, separate, cloud-based resources together. You don't write your own router. You don't write your own authentication system. You wire up other people's. It's a slightly different way of thinking. So when are you going to use this stuff? Responding to webhooks is where most people get started in this. Something like that. I quite like doing that. It's quite an easy way to get a little bit of compute power up and running with a minimal amount of cost and minimal amount of effort. Mm. Anything that looks a bit like a static website that you need some back-end compute power, this works really well. Contact form on a static website, it's a good way to do it. Just drop in a serverless function and you're done. Um, obviously, things like PWAs need a back-end API. Serverless works well for that. Any additional features to your current platform? So you want to spin off a little bit of functionality or add a bit of functionality to your current application, maybe serverless is a good way to get that little bit of additional functionality in. If you've got variable traffic levels, this is a really efficient way to write an application. You'll notice that more and more startups are going down the serverless route because they don't have to worry so much about the way the traffic works against the amount of money they're paying. And you see that because the costs scale with your traffic. So here's some serverless platforms. Big four, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, IBM, have all got serverless platforms. Some open source ones at the bottom there. FN is called Function. Uh, Apache OpenWhisk and OpenFAS are all three open source serverless platforms that you can run in your own environment. These ones run PHP. The ones with the solid circles, IBM Cloud, Apache OpenWhisk, and OpenFAS, run it natively, straight, off the, straight out of the box. AWS, since November last year, 
can also run PHP pretty seamlessly now with the new feature they added last November. So they're also a very good place to put your service PHP code. Azure and Google Cloud, not so much. We're going to talk about Apache OpenWiz first. I like open source stuff. I've always been a fan of open source. I like open source a lot. You can tell by the word Apache in here that this is an open source thing. So I quite like it. I'm the contributor to this. I'm a member of the uh, community of committers to Apache OpenWhisk, and I write the PHP runtime. So I'm admittedly completely and utterly biased. Because when you run serverless PHP on Apache OpenWhisk, it's running my code, and I know how that works, so I quite like it. That's how it works. All right, so Apache OpenWhisk has got a commercial provider on IBM Cloud. So if you go run IBM Cloud, then you're also running Apache OpenWhisk, which is quite cool. So we have sources, things that are going to happen. Your GitHub webhooks, your um, cron jobs, your events coming out of databases, things like that. Those events are triggered and are connected to your source code. And for the source code, we call them actions or functions or methods. It's a new technology, so we invent new words. And we connect them via rules so that we can have one tr event trigger multiple actions, or we can rewire a given event to a different action if we need to. We've got a way to join these things together. You can also do HTTP requests. So something that looks like an API is going to come in and talk to you, run your code. And there is a CLI for managing it all. Language agnostic. OpenWhisk runs all these languages natively. The Docker symbol, I realize, is not a language. Um, but you can literally run any code that takes standard in and can create standard out. So there's someone who's written some Fortran stuff on serverless Docker. I think they're crazy, but it is doable. You've probably never seen that, never seen that language before. That one's Ballerina. I'd never heard of it until I saw the pull request come in. It's a language. We care about this one. So that's what we're going to talk about. Hello world. Looks like that. It's only three lines of code there, so it's not very complicated. So I can explain it fairly quickly. We have an entry point. Main. Call your function main and it's your entry point to your application. That dates all the way back to C or possibly even before then. You don't have to call it main. In Apache OpenWhisk, you can change its name. Practically nobody bothers. Not very, very infrequently. All your input to your function, to your action, comes in through that array of arguments, the event parameters. This makes testing really easy. You do some work. So line four, we are going to look for the name parameter. If it doesn't exist, we're going to use the word world. And then you have to return some sort of result. We call it the service result. It can be whatever you like. If it's a dictionary, it will turn into JSON for you automatically. We upload it via a command line tool. All these systems have got command line tools. The OpenWhisk one is called WSK because vowels were in short supply when they wrote this app. I've got no idea why. We pronounce it WISK, but we couldn't even put the vowels in. The general format for the WISC command is object noun. I don't, uh, sorry, object verb. So we have an action. What do we want to do to the action? We want to update it or create it. OpenWISC is clever enough to know that if you try to update an action that doesn't exist, you probably want to create it, which is quite convenient for CI tooling. Name of the action, we're going to call it hello because I'm not good at naming things. And then we need a PHP code. What file are we going to actually run? Hello.php. And then the tool says it's uploaded OK. We go run it via the command line. Whisk action again. Invoke, because the word run is too short and it's not cool enough for a new technology. So we have the new word, invoke. It just means to run it or execute it. Name hello. Minus minus result will return the output synchronously. Otherwise, it will be an asynchronous request. And you'll get back an ID, and then you'll have to go and poll to find out if it's finished. So minus minus result, and then we get back our hello world. Done. That's all that's involved 
to run serverless PHP. It's not particularly complicated. It's a simple function. What's going on under the hood? One of the really nice things about having some open source implementations is that we can look at them and find out how they work. In terms of uh, OpenWhisk, it's written in Scala. My Scala is about as good as my JavaScript. So I can do it, but not very well. But fortunately, there are brighter people on the project and they told me what it does. Look, something like this. There's a few other bits and pieces, but I got bored drawing it, so this is the bits you get. Our entry point is over here. On the left, Nginx. That's our reverse proxy at the front. All the data comes into there, which tells you that the control for OpenWhisk is an API. You authenticate the API, and the Whisk command line tool is simply an API to OpenWhisk platform. It goes into the controller. The controller is of stuff written in Scala. It uses console for service discovery, which is an open source product from Apache. That mostly is Apache, actually. CouchDB, I think they're part of the Apache project now. That's the data store. Kafka, that's a queue system so that we don't lose any of the instructions. The invoker will fire up our actual containers. So the actual containers are Docker containers. So whenever we want to run any code, we have a Docker container, we put the code in the Docker container and run it. That's fundamentally all that's going on. A few pretty diagrams show the flow. When you create an action, all that happens is the API, sorry, the WISC command line tool will post an API call to the controller with source code that you want to run and drop it into CouchDB. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't validate it. You can send up what you like and it'll just drop into CouchDB for you. When you invoke it, a bit more stuff happens. Again, we have the post to the controller. The controller will then go via the queue system to the invoker. The invoker will retrieve your source code out of CouchDB, fire up a Docker container, put the code into the Docker container via the init message, and will then execute that code via the run message. Once your code is run, we get the results back, we drop them into CouchDB because you're going to want some logs. And then we, if you've done a synchronous request, it will send the result back out to the controller and back to the client. So there's a little bit of a flow going on. Interesting bit happens in that container. This is what happens in the container. So that our, source, our Docker container hosts your code. It's in its own container so that we don't accidentally share code between different people. That would be bad. Two endpoints, init and run. So the invoker will kick off the Docker container and will post to an init endpoint inside the container with the source code. Once the source code is there, it will then call the run endpoint to execute it. Because they are two separate requests, we can call the run request again and again and again. So once you've got your container going, we can execute the same action multiple times, which is quite cool. Because if you're going to need to do you know, 20,000 requests, you don't want to keep creating the Docker container every time because that's boring and expensive. So we just keep the container going. At some point, OpenWhisk gets bored of having this container around and will kill it. Don't assume it will stay alive forever, it won't. Because there's two separate parts, we can define that initial setup time as our startup latency, and we call that the cold start time. So the cold start time only happens when we have to kick off a new container. And it's a combination of starting Docker and getting the source code into the container. As you can imagine, starting a Java container takes longer because there's so much more code involved. It's a bigger thing to get into the container. That's it. That's how serverless systems work. So what I've told you here is how OpenWhisk works because that's the one that we can actually see. But practically, they all work basically the same way. Lambda works basically the same way. Uh, Google Cloud Functions works basically the same way. Does that make sense? Are we all clear? Cool. So that's Apache OpenWhisk. Practically, most of you don't have IBM Cloud accounts, do you? How many of you have an Amazon account, an AWS account? A few more of you. So let's talk about Lambda. Lambda is obviously the 
big um, supplier in this space. They are arguably virtually a monopoly in some ways. You can do PHP on Amazon Lambda since November 2018 because they introduced something called Layers and they introduced something called the Runtime API. So this stuff is pretty much brand new. It's about two and a half months old, something like that. And it is quite nice. You could do it before then, but it was horrible. So this is the process involved in getting something, a PHP function working with Lambda. You've got two things to do. Firstly, you need a layer. Your layer needs to have a PHP binary in it, and it needs to have a bootstrap script that Lambda will execute. And then your bootstrap script will do the work. Once you've written your function, the bootstrap script will execute it for you. If you want to read up on how all that works, then acrobat.com slash lambda PHP is a blog post I wrote on it. This is fundamentally what goes on in your bootstrap file, to all intents and purposes. There's a bit of other stuff going on, of course, but loosely, you sit in a loop forever. You go and ask Lambda, have you got a function you want to run? Have we got a new invocation? That is essentially a blocking call. So you wait for it. Eventually, Lambda goes, yes, please run this invocation. So you get back the event payload. The event payload is simply the parameters that need to be executed for this invocation. Call our, own, our source code, our handler function. You get back a result, send the result to Lambda and then just sit in the loop, waiting and waiting and waiting until Lambda gets bored and kills the container. So it's the same basic system. And we just sit in the loop, executing code. I showed you using the command line tool, and I also, I haven't shown you this because I don't really do websites, but when you first start looking at tutorials on Lambda, they will show you how to do it via their website. And there's this lovely console where you can click and point and things. You can even write your JavaScript code straight inside the website. Click some buttons, wire some stuff up, and you have a service application. Never ever do that for a production website. Web consoles are the worst things ever for repeatability. If you're going to do something that you want to repeat, put it in your source code control system. So we have that phrase, infrastructure as code. Ansible is a good example of this. Chef is another one for provisioning servers. If you can't repeat the process, then it is not suitable for production. Serverless Framework is a toolkit for managing serverless applications and deploying them onto a cloud provider, Lambda, OpenWhisk, IBM Cloud Functions, Google Cloud, whatever they call theirs. Azure's got one, I forgot what, they're probably called Azure Functions as well, thinking about it. Um, it doesn't matter, it is provider agnostic, but it enables you to compose and create a description of what you want your serverless application to look like, and then it will set up your provider to make that happen. So it's amazingly powerful and a very good way to make sure that you can repeat it more than once. It's a YAML file because some reason YAML is popular at the moment. I'm so looking forward to when this phase ends. But it's YAML at the moment, so if you like YAML, you're good. If you're like me and think YAML's horrible, then we just have to live with it. I have to give it a name. So service hello lambda.php, sorry, hello lambda.php is the name of my application. I'm not very imaginative with names, as you can tell. Need to provide that because serverless framework is provider agnostic, I want it to be on AWS, and I want to use the provided runtime, which is the one that uses the runtime API, and you need to choose your memory size. The way the cost model works for serverless is that you are charged by the amount of memory multiplied by the amount of time in gigabit seconds. Gigabyte seconds, sorry. And it's something like 0.003 cents per gigabyte second. It feels like nothing until you start running an awful lot of stuff and then something gets expensive. So choose your memory size wisely. On AWS in particular, if you choose a smaller memory size, they give you a worse CPU to get you to spend more money. They're clever like that. Everyone else doesn't do that, but Amazon does. 
And then you need to define your layer. We need a layer to have our PHP binary in it. So that's what that bit there defines. We write our function. This function should look remarkably familiar to the one I showed you before, because all these systems look roughly the same. We still have the entry point with some event data. We have to decode it ourselves this time. JSON throw an error. Best PHP 7.3 feature ever. I'm sure 7.3 does other stuff, but it's worth upgrading just for that. Do the actual business logic, whatever it might be, and then return the result. Exactly the same logic as before. Stick it into a serverless framework's application manifest. Give it a name, hello, tell it where the, where the uh, code is. So hello dot, sorry, handler dot hello means hello dot p, uh, handler dot PHP, the hello method inside it. And then I have to tell it which layer I want to also use, which is my PHP one. And I'm done. Deploys like that, you run SLS deploy because when the serverless framework was invented, vowels were in short supply again. I don't know what it is about it, but SLS at least makes more sense because serverless is a really long word to type each time. And it does some stuff and eventually it finishes. You can invoke it, use it. Oh, no more, no more power. Oh, gone. I can't really tell Whoa, there we go. There's you. Where were we? There. Uh, invoke it like that. Um, it works basically the same as the OpenWhisk command line tool, we get the response back. Having told you all that, don't do any of that, use Bref instead. So I've told you how it works on Lambda. Bref is community maintained PHP runtime for Lambda uh, by a guy called Matthew Napoli, I think his name is. And it's really good. So if you want to play and actually put serverless PHP onto Lambda in production, I highly recommend you just use Bref. But it's basically the same way. I'm going to talk through a case study now, an application that I've written, my Project 365 Photo A Day website. Um, those of you who know me might know that I take photos a lot. I like taking photos. I take a photo, at least one photo every day, because if I don't, I won't remember what happened in my life. I'll forget. So I take a photo every single day. I upload them to Flickr, because Flickr is still current from when I was born. It's been around a long while, and it's now actually useful again, which is quite nice. Now it's no longer run by Yahoo. So I've uploaded all my photos to Flickr. I upload all my photos to Flickr, but I only want the Project 365 ones on its own website, because I would like to see it as a body of work. So I wrote a little application, well I wrote a website for this, and then wrote some Lambda to make it all work. So it's just a static website, just displays some photos. The photos are hosted on Flickr, I merely need to drop them into some HTML. Put it on S3, because that seems like a fairly good place to put a static website nowadays. CloudFront in front of it, a nice CDN, that's quite cool. And then a Lambda PHP function to retrieve the data out of Flickr to build that HTML page. This is pretty common in terms of a very small serverless website, a serverless application. I'm using third party components for it. This is how it's going to work. I've got the cron job going. So every couple of hours, my Lambda PHP function is going to run. It's going to go to Flickr via the Flickr API and pull down all the images with the 2019 tag for this year. Obviously, if I want to build last year's one, I'll use the 2018 tag. Once it's got the images, it's going to build some HTML. Once it's built the HTML, it's going to push it to S3 via the S3 API. And once it's done that, it's going to clear the CloudFront CDN because otherwise we won't see my new pictures, and my new pictures look great. So that's all this function has to do. And it looks, oh, it's a bit serverless first, a bit serverless configuration to do that. Um, function name is update. <coughs> There's my handler, update.php, and I call by function name main. I've also got layer. I need some environment variables this time, because 
I need my Flickr API key and I need to know which user I'm going to pull the 2019 pictures from. And obviously I want my pictures and not your pictures. That would be silly. Environment variables are the way we handle that. But you're probably doing that already because environment variables are a really good way to do configuration at any level of web app. And then I need to set up my cron job. So I'm defining an event called schedule, I give it a name and it's a cron rate of every two hours. So this is what I mean by I've got a YAML file that is describing my application. And then this description magically turns into the right things happening on AWS. There's other bits in this file for dealing with IAM, which is their um, permission system, creating the bucket, wiring the bucket up and wiring up the CloudFront um, connections as well. They're all in my YAML file, but they're all quite boring, so I've not bothered putting them on the slide for you. The function looks something like that. It's not that long, it's not that complicated. Bit of setup stuff. We need to pull out those environment variables because we're going to need them. Pick up the year via a parameter because I do want to build last year's and the year before. That's what I was going to build out my website of it. And then this bit does the work. Page creator will go and retrieve the Flickr API data. Sorry, go to the Flickr API, receive the data and build the HTML. Then the uploader is going to upload it to S3 and then invalidate my cache. Source code wise, it looks something like this. Fetching the photos from Flickr. Flickr calls this a RESTful API and it is incredibly misnamed. It is not. It's more of an RPC API. I can tell this because method is one of the parameters you pass in. I want to do a search. So I tell it I want to do a photo search. I want to use my API key and I'm going to use my user ID and I'm going to use the year tag and it's going to return me all the data. The extras one just gives me a few extra columns of the data that I want to receive. This client is a Guzzle because Guzzle is quite a good HTTP client in PHP. So we just call a get request to the Flickr API, get the response, decode it and I've now got my list of photos. And then I build the HTML. I'm not going to show you how I built the HTML because I'm embarrassed by it. <laughs> I don't do HTML, it's other people's problem. I'm a back-end person. Um, just trust me, it's good enough. <laughs> Uploading to S3 is way more interesting because it's more API work, and that's the bit I like. S3 Client. S3 Client is from the Amazon PHP SDK. The Amazon's PHP SDK, I don't know if you've used it, is really, really good. It's comprehensive. It covers everything. I know Drew disagrees with me. But I thought it was quite good. So. Clearly, he's used it way more than I have. <laughs> um, you tell it the version, you give it a region. Some magic variables, of, uh, environment variables, have turned up in my Lambda. AWS default region is the region I deployed my Lambda to. So I can talk to the same region without having to remember where I've deployed it, which is really handy, because now I can deploy my Lambda to multiple different regions, and it will use the different buckets so I can spread out appropriately in terms of resilience if I need to do it that way. It also puts the credentials for my user that I've got connected to my Lambda into the environment variables as well. So you'll notice there's no AWS um, authentication key or anything like that because they're behind the scenes. And the S3 client will pick them up automatically out of the environment variables that the Lambda has already set. That's quite neat. There's some very joined up thinking within the AWS ecosystem. They very much would like you to use all of their services and charge you for every single one. Once you've got your S3 client, you can call put object and it will upload whatever data you give it into a file in your bucket. Don't forget to set the content type. Things get very confused if you don't set the right content type for the data you put up there. It took me a while to work that one out. Public read is a good idea if you would like other people to be able to see my wonderful website. Ah. CloudFront. I've set this CloudFront up to basically never invalidate on its own because I know when I'm going to change the file underneath it, so I don't need it to ever time out. Once it's pushed the HTML out to the, what do we call it now, the edge. We call it the edge, don't we? 
um, it can stay there. It's never going to change unless I change the file behind the scenes. So I have to manually invalidate the CloudFront CDN. And that's done via CloudFront client. It works the same way as the S3 client, which makes it easy to use. You have to create a invalidation thing, a batch, they call it. This batch needs a caller reference. The only important thing about the caller reference is it must be unique. I run this every two hours, so the date to the nearest second is more than unique enough for me. But that must be unique. Again, it gets a bit confused if you don't make that unique. And then you need to give it the list of items that you want to be invalidated. So dollaryear.html is clearly my HTML file. Rather strangely, you have to tell it how many items are in that array. I kind of feel like it could count it themselves. But you, if you don't tell it that there's one item in this array, again, it gets confused. Sorry, it doesn't work. I don't know. Maybe this is the part that Drew doesn't like about their API. <laughs> so, presumably, you know. Do you really know what you're doing? Um, and that's it, that's the code that I've written inside my Lambda. So my Lambda is a function. So we talk about this as a function as a service, but my function consists of a function and two different classes that are talking to two different components plus a guzzle in order to get the work done. So there's actually more code involved in one of these than just those three or four lines of code. You, know, you can put quite a lot of code into your function. Your function consists of multiple methods. One of the things I quite like about OpenWhisk is that we call it an action because an action can have multiple functions and things get slightly less confusing when you're talking about it. And this is my wonderful website. So it's very nearly designed. That's from the 18th of January because on that day I took an awesome picture of my Nintendo Switch running Zelda 2 from the original NES. So I quite like the picture, so that's one I've left up there. The newer pictures are not quite so interesting. Or maybe not so interesting to me, maybe. It's just a simple static website. So I'm going to sum up what I've told you. You need to know this stuff. Serverless computing, the whole concept of running small self-contained functions in the cloud is going to be a key part of the sort of stuff you're going to be developing in five or so years time. I could be a bit wrong on that. It might be three years time. It might be next year. It might be six years time. But the cost model, the abstraction model, make this a really good solution to an awful lot of problems that we have to deal with daily. The horizontal scaling is amazingly helpful. No, never having to worry about how much capacity you've got because it's handled for you is pretty cool. Only being charged if the code is being run is an extremely cost efficient way to run source code and run applications. So I expect that we'll all be dealing with serverless in some form or another within the next five or so years. So you should be aware that this is coming because I think you'll find out that you'll end up doing some, particularly for jobs off the sides of your main applications and things like that. It's not for everything. Some work tasks, it makes no sense. If you are currently running a website that is 95% CPU um, utilization for 365 days a year, then it's cheaper to do that on EC2 or probably even on bare metal than it is to do it in something like serverless. But most of us are not running CPU utilizations anywhere close to that. And this starts looking remarkably cost effective and remarkably efficient. You don't have to worry about an awful lot of code. You don't have to worry about routing. That's done by something called an API gateway. Most of the connections to stuff are handled elsewhere. So the amount of code you are writing goes down. There is a trade-off to that though, in that you end up with lots of little lambdas and lots of connections between them. So it becomes harder to understand what's going on in your application because it looks different. So that is a paradigm shift that we are going to have to handle as an industry if this does go the way I expect it to go. And that's it. So hopefully you now understand how serverless works, what serverless is, how it can be used. You can do it in PHP, so you can worry about learning the serverless bit independently of having to write JavaScript, which can only be a good thing. 
Thank you for listening to that. Oh, some resources. Go and look at those. This is on, will be uploaded so onto Joined In, so you can read them all there. So I will take that slide off again. There's a Joined In link. You will go there because I really want a drink. <laughs> and Dave is not going to open the bar until you have left me 10 five-star reviews. Thanks very much. I'll take questions, yeah. Well, whilst you're writing your reviews, because the bar's not open yet. <laughs> if you've got lots of these little tasks, lots of these little actions, how, uh, how do people go around testing these things now? Like the integration of them, not, I can see how they're right. trying to test them. So yeah, as you, as you can imagine, testing an individual function is relatively easy because you've got known inputs and a known output. They're trivial to test at the unit level. Integration testing has to be done on the cloud, pretty much. And the way I do that on OpenWhisk is uh, in my OpenWhisk, sorry, in my IBM cloud account, I have got multiple environments. I've got a live environment, a dev environment, and a, um, what do I call it, UAT environment. So I can work on my dev environment and run integration tests there. And it's completely isolated from my live environment. It's basically a copy of it. And then, so when I push to GitHub, I run a CI tool via, tra via Travis that then kicks off the code into the correct environment. So I do it like that. That tends to be the way people do it. You essentially load up your um, DynamoDB if you're using Amazon, your Firebase, I think it is, if you're using Google, put the right data in there, and then run integration tests. So the integration tests work? Yes, well, mine do. I don't know if yours do. <laughs> can you do atomic deploy, then, if you need to, if, if, like, two of these little, um, what's the terminology? Let's call them actions. Two, two actions be changing. Can you atomically deploy them? Can you atomically deploy multiple actions simultaneously? Kind of. Um, Amazon are the most advanced on this stuff. They can do blue-green deploys. I don't know enough about how they do it in terms of the wiring between the actions. As a general rule, you should never have one action that calls another action, in, certainly not in Lambda. In general, you should decouple your actions via a queue. So you have one action, it drops a... So you, you have an event happens, an event happens results in your function running, your function has an output that needs further processing. You drop it onto a queue as a job. The queue will then fire another action that takes that job and does the next bit, drops into the database or whatever it might do. So you've decoupled the two parts. So as long as you've not changed your message format in your queue, then you're okay. Conversely, you could, even if you put it on the queue, you could put it on different queues for the old Lambda and the new Lambda. You could do that. So there are multiple ways to do that. That's part of what I mean by a slightly different way of thinking. You should always decouple everything because things will scale differently. And if you suddenly get a whole load of traffic, you're going to scale out your first, end, your first lambda to a thousand simultaneous actions. But you might not need them all to result in a thousand simultaneous actions for the data processing. Just drop them on the queue and maybe only have 50 actions running back there because it can be a bit slower now that you've responded out of the front end ones. So you have to think slightly differently like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. I had a question around databases. So yeah, don't use them. They're horrible. <laughs> and that's in a first partly there, right? Because there's uh, in one of your examples that was not provided, which was NoSQL. How, if, if you already have your entire application, a database, for example, or if you uh, are setting something up or you want that kind of control, would you uh, API it and look for a sort of uh, a third spot or a question, how do you deal with it if you will? All right, so how do you do with databases? Right, the biggest problem with databases is that they don't scale. They're rubbish at scaling, relatively speaking. Um, you can run databases in the cloud by definition. So I think Amazon call it Aurora, maybe. I think it's called Aurora, which is their Postgres on MySQL or something on the cloud. Um, you can get databases in the cloud. Microsoft, obviously, if you go into Azure, they call it SQL Server in the cloud, but it's basically SQL Server. They're fine. Um, you run your PHP, you connect to by PDO to your database, and it just works. If you're in Amazon, you use something called a virtual private 
Thing network, VPN, v something, VPC. There's a way of creating a private connection to so that it's encrypted and etc. Um, it just works as you would expect. The problem is that it's auto scaling. So Lambda thinks nothing about running up a thousand simultaneous copies of your function. The chances of your database accepting a thousand simultaneous requ uh, requests into it is relatively slim. In MySQL land, we call that E, too many connections, because it comes up all the time if you've got too many connections running. And we try to mitigate that. And that's one of the reasons why you stick a queue between the front end and what's going into your database so that you can manage how many you're scaling. This is one of the reasons why things like DynamoDB and Firebase on the Google side are coming into prominence, because they are much, much better at handling cloud-based loads, cloud-based scaling, cloud-based type workloads as a rule. But yeah, databases just work. Um, I didn't show you that. I've got another case study which uses Postgres as back end. It works fine. But you migrate to something like Firebase, for example? Yeah. No, not personally. <laughs> if you need a relational database, you need a relational database. Let's face it, if you need to be able to join via um, rows and columns and keys, then a relational database is really good at that. If that's not the way your data should be organized, then it's a rubbish way to do it. We all use relational databases too much at the moment. I'm about to rant. How are you doing on those reviews? Um, they, relational databases are really, really good because you can put pretty much any data in them and it'll work pretty well. But for an awful lot of the workloads we do, we would be better off with different types of databases, but we don't know them so well, so we don't use them. DynamoDB and Firebase are one of the few areas where as an industry, we are beginning to start exploring this in a fairly sensible way. And I think there's, if you think about the way you hold your data and the way you relate your data, an awful lot of it works better as a document than it does as a set of rows and columns. Um, but having said that, most of my clients live in 2005 if I'm lucky, 1990 if I'm unlucky. And so I'm all about relational databases a lot of the time. How can you guarantee that the functions are run in order? How can I guarantee functions are run in order? So, because you, so you have all the start time, I guess it's variable, depending. Yeah. So, and then if you scale each function, then you might have several doctors running at the same time. Yeah. So, if one function comes, another comes later, maybe the one that comes later comes finished before the first one. Yeah. Highly possible, but it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. I mean, you can't control that now. So I've got four web heads and a load balancer and six requests come in. How do I know which one happens first? Or does the fifth one happen before the fourth one is finished? Maybe the third one takes a bit longer, so the sixth one finishes before the third is finished. That happens today. Because any given auto scale that happens is for the same functional concept. So my action that... Um, now, if I was writing an API, for instance, so I've got an action that retrieves, I don't know, to-do items. If I get 5,000 people all want to retrieve their to-do items, then I spin up 1,000 lambdas. Well, I don't. Amazon does. Amazon spins up 1,000 lambdas to service all those get requests. The order they're happening doesn't really matter. But if I need sequential things to happen, then I can either call one action from another action and risk a scalability issue, or I can put a queue in, drop them on the queue, and then pull them off the queue, do a bit more processing, put them onto another queue, and then pull them off that second queue and drop them into a database or whatever I'm doing. And then the, the order is controlled by which queue they're on in which, and which action runs after each queue item. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in AWS, you can control the HP runtime with layers. How do you do that in OpenWest? How do you say you want to use 7.3 and 7.6. Um, the runtime parameter. So in OpenWhisk, I would set the runtime to PHP colon 7.3. Is that just uh, the Docker image you pull down? Conceptually, yes. Oh, so you can write your own. You can, actually, you can totally write your own Docker image and pull it into OpenWhisk, yeah. But it has to be on public hub, Docker Hub. If you want a private Docker image, you have to run your own private OpenWhisk because none of the commercial providers will let you talk to a private Docker hub. But yeah, in, 
In OpenWhisk, you can totally create your own PHP runtime from my PHP runtime, load it with all the extensions that I haven't bothered putting in there, and then use that runtime. But don't put commercially sensitive code in there because you're about to put it on hub.docker. Um, so coming on to the testing question, are there any kind of like testing tooling out there to kind of do integration testing? It's coming. The problem is, this is all new and exciting, and hence there's lots of venture capitalist money involved, which means that you can do some of this stuff already, but if you want to do the really cool stuff, you have to pay lots of money to, on a monthly basis. So I don't do that very often, as you can imagine, because I mostly hobby this stuff. I've got one commercial um, serverless thing in play at the moment, and that's a add-on to an existing website. So I don't need that level of commercial support. So I've not looked at these tools very much, but there are some amazing tooling coming. But Lambda was only invented in 2014. Well, late November 2014. So realistically, it's only been around since 2015. So we're only into the start of the fourth year. So it's very immature in some ways. But in other ways, it's quite mature. Like you can get login systems that will tell you how much every single web operation on your website will cost you to the cents. So you want to know how much it costs you to uh, register a user? It will tell you it costs you 35 cents to register each user. How much does it cost to change their password? 45 cents. How much does it cost to put something in the basket? It will be able to tell you that because the pricing model is so granular. So there's some quite interesting tooling happening, but I don't know much about it, so I can't give you, oh, you must use this tool, sorry. My, all my stuff is done via curl and stuff like that. <laughs> and how long is a current start? Oh, mine, on the PHP runtime, it's nearly up to 150 milliseconds. Depends. <laughs> it's like, you, you've seen those graphs. 90% you know, of them are sort of 75 to 80 milliseconds. 95% of them are in the 100, 130 milliseconds. 100% of them is about six seconds or something stupid because one of them fails. So it's a, it depends, but they're, they're not, it's not slow, slow, but it's not instant. But then for that 10% of requests that will take, say, up more than three seconds, is that suitable for an add to cart on an e-commerce site? You tell me. I mean, how, how many of those do you get at the moment? When was the last time you actually measured it? Yeah, you're not telling me that every single request that hits your current EC2 is responding at exactly the same speed when you're under load. Well, it isn't happening like that. And I bet nobody's actually measured it either. Because nobody does. Um, because there's not enough of them to matter. At least hopefully. And if there's enough of them to matter, then you can afford someone to fix it. So, oh, there's one down here somewhere. No, at the back, sorry. Um, you actually use serverless in the lab. I don't know if you serve it already. Do I use serverless? I haven't used serverless in a big production environment. The biggest provider I know is Netflix. Netflix is pretty much all serverless. They just moved to AWS Yes. Then nearly all their stuff is now on Lambda except for the actual streaming. So the issue is because it seems like we're breaking down the into the functional thing. Small units of work. Sets, where does it sit? You, I assume you would need like a documentation of thousands of pages to be able to keep up with the structure and the model. That's the question. If you're going to build an application that is built, is entirely serverless, how big is it? How many actions are involved? How do you document that? So right, this works. Having an e-commerce, which is master in terms of how many interactions might have, but you could break it down to that level. I suppose. I don't, know I don't think it makes much difference because if you take your average monolith, how well do you document that? Oh, it's not. All it is is we are doing the same thing at the network level rather than at the code level. But another way to think about it is the way to get to a serverless application is normally through microservices. It's fairly rare that you take your monolith and create a fantastic decoupled serverless application. Practically, we don't have the skill sets to do that. Now, I'd find it really hard to take the monolith that my client wrote 15 years ago and turn it into a fantastic the organized serverless application. That would be really, really hard. What's much easier is to start breaking off separate microservices 
And then your microservices could either be a standalone mini monolith sitting on an EC2, or we can <coughs> split it up into a serverless thing. So you're only documenting a microservice, not an entire application. That's how I would build it. Maybe other people will build it differently. And that's also how Netflix fights. They're all I, microservices. I would imagine so, because they're not stupid. Um, I was so hoping you were about to say the bar's open, but OK. <laughs> Where does Compose fit this? Compose just works. Um, but do you ship your dependencies with each action? Do you end up with yes. more than you would do with No, well, yes and no. Right, so the way I build multiple ones. So a, given, a, a single server shamble file can have multiple actions inside it. Now, for each action, you can tell it which files need to be uploaded for that one particular action. So what you can do is you can say, just upload the entire vendor folder to every single action, please. Or you can say, I only need vendor slash this, vendor slash that, vendor slash the other for this particular action. If you've got a set of common um, requirements, drop them in a layer. Layers load fairly quickly. So I've seen people create two layers, one layer for their PHP binary and another layer for their vendor folder. So then they just reference a, a vendor folder via their layer. That is another way of doing it. Um, practically, it's up to you. If you're on OpenWiz, you can just create another Docker container with the relevant um, stuff in there already. If you're using the OpenWiz PHP runtime, it already has Guzzle as part of its vendor folder by default, because that's what I use all the time. So I included it in my runtime. Uh, the benefit of being the one who creates it. Um, yeah, it, it's just. They're just files, they're just PHP files. I didn't show it on here, but basically, if you've got more than one PHP file, you zip it up and then upload the zip file to the container, to the uh, serverless provider. They'll work the same basic way. Sort of related. Um, so, what's the performance implications then? Because, like the AWS one, is about 8 gig of code. It takes longer to create your cold start but not significantly enough for me to care. It kind of depends what you're doing. I mean, this is on a cron job. It doesn't really worry me if it takes 200 milliseconds to cold start. I don't particularly care. Um, but yes, there is obviously an implication. If you create a PHP application that's one function big and is, you know, as you say, four and a half gigabytes worth of PHP code, it will take a little bit longer to load that Docker container up as a result. So that needs paying attention to if you care enough. I don't think it matters 99% of the time. I think we're done. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Cheers.